Dear friends and followers, welcome back to my channel and lovely greetings from the rescue helicopter here in Ulm in the southern part of Germany. Are you interested in becoming a helicopter pilot? Or let's be more specific, a rescue helicopter pilot. Do you want to know about all the steps you have to take in order to fly this beautiful aircraft? Then this video is for you. I'll be frank with you, I don't know much about helicopters or how to become a helicopter pilot. And that's why I'll be interviewing Jens, whose job is to fly this Airbus H145. And therefore, we have put together more than 30 questions which should answer everything you want to know. Jens and I will also perform an outside check of his helicopter to show you the ins and outs of this incredible machine. So get your notepad out and let's get started. Ah. Jens, it's a first of all pleasure meeting you. Hi Joey, my pleasure. <laughs> Give us a brief introduction about yourself. Well, my name is Jens Jasper. I'm 38 years old. Um, I'm married. I have two boys. <laughs> and, um, well, I have a passion for, like, anything related to aviation. And mm -hmm. I work as a HEMS pilot, so that means Helicopter Emergency Medical Services for ADAC Luftrettung. What made you want to become a helicopter pilot? Well, I grew up in the vicinity of a military helicopter base, mm -hmm. so uh, there were helicopters like everywhere around me. Mm -hmm. I got in touch with um, several helicopter pilots, military helicopter pilots. My best friend's father was one. Mm -hmm. um, so so that, that topic uh, never really left me, or it was always around me. Mm -hmm. And um, I think at the age of like five or six, I developed that strive to become a helicopter <laughs> pilot myself. Nice. Do you remember the first time you actually sat in a helicopter? Um, I can't date it exactly, but it must have been around at the age of six. Oh, really? That early? Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. I, I only got into an airplane while well, flying myself at the age of 14, and that had a huge impact on my <laughs> life. Tell us a little about where did most of your training took part? Well, I joined the Air Force mm -hmm. when I was 19, so just uh, out of school. Mm -hmm. um, became an officer first, and then started flight training. Um, so in 2005, actually, uh, was the first time that I actually flew a helicopter. Mm -hmm. um, so most of my training was in the military, in the Air Force, to be precise. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I, I gained a lot of experience there nice. and uh, finally left the Air Force to join the Civil Rescue Service. Okay, but your military training, was that more catered towards becoming a fighter helicopter pilot or a transport helicopter pilot? I flew uh, solely transport helicopters, yeah. um, which, which was great fun to me and, and just the, the whole envelope of, of procedures and, <laughs> and things that you, you get to do. Cool. Um, that was amazing and I, and I never wanted to fly a fighter helicopter, mm -hmm. a tech heli helicopter or anything. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Transport helicopters was really my thing. First helicopter you started in on, with the training wise, which one was that? The very first was the uh, BO 105. Um, okay. Quite, we'll put, quite, it, we'll put quite a picture in there. Famous actually. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The Red Bull has one. Uh, okay. Um, then I uh, I went to uh, fly EC 135, so mm -hmm. Eurocopter helicopters uh, that we do fly um, in the ADAC Luftrettung as well. Mm -hmm. And um, eventually I got to fly Yuris, so okay. the, the yeah. famous choppers. Yeah. Um, and I ended up flying a Sikorsky 53s. That huge. was the, that was his, you said something about 19 times? Yes, right. That's a, quite, quite huge, a big <laughs> quite enormous <laughs> and impressive. Where did you gain most of your flight hours to give you actually the possibility to, to apply at the ADAC Luftrettung? Well, when I uh, left the Air Force, uh, there were not plenty um, of flight hours on my, um, say, in my logbook. Mm -hmm. ADAC Luftrettung gave me the chance to apply as a so-called PICUS, mm -hmm. which means pilot in command under supervision. Mm -hmm. So um, I had only 750 hours when I left the Air Force, okay. so joined the ADAC and had the chance to, to build up the remaining hours. Mm -hmm. um, well, you, you need a thousand at least. Okay. And it took me about one year to gain these hours right, um, to enable me to become a um, commander in the Luftrettung. So meaning you were actually sitting in the left-hand seat as a co-pilot and the commander on the right-hand seat and you were, as you said, in this PICOS program and that's where you gained your remaining 250 hours to then become a commander. Correct. I started mm -hmm. on the left-hand seat. Mm -hmm. um, then after um, I gained 
plenty of experience to move the right hand seat. Mm -hmm. I actually moved to the right seat. Mm -hmm. The commander so took place in the left hand seat. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, eventually, I, I acted to to kind of simulate being the commander. Yeah. Under the supervision. Under of supervision. The, yeah. Okay. Cool. Nice. Commander. Now, speaking yeah. of the helicopter in the background, are you rated? solely on this helicopter or do you have ratings for other helicopters as well? I'm uh, rated on um, all kinds of helicopters that <laughs> yeah. we operate in the ADAC Luftrettung. Mm -hmm. So um, basically it is the um, Airbus EC or H135 mm -hmm. and it's, it is the H145 that you see in the background. Mm -hmm. um, plus, plus we have uh, all sorts of uh, variants and I operate these as well. Nice, okay. I heard some of you that you are also an instructor or you can act as an instructor for the ADAC? Yeah, that is right. I am a, a type rating instructor, so mm -hmm. I am, um, instruct um, rated pilots, mm -hmm. uh, pilots to fly that very um, aircraft. Okay. So they, they come with a license, but yeah. not necessarily with a, with a type rating. Understood. And um, I may, may instruct type rating training mm -hmm. and also uh, night vision goggle training. Okay, nice. Speaking of your day as a rescue helicopter pilot, can you just take us briefly from literally your morning uh, to the evening when your shift ends? <laughs> yeah, well, basically um, the shift starts at 6.30. Okay. Um, then we get ready for the day. We mm -hmm. do the pre-flight checks uh, mm -hmm. in terms of helicopter, but also in terms of medical equipment. Mm -hmm. um, we need to check uh, for weather, um, the notums mm -hmm. as well. And after doing so, um, we start the day with a breakfast, mm -hmm. have our briefing during mm -hmm. that breakfast, and uh, then we sort of stand by for anything to come. Nice, okay. Now we have the slightly unusual situation today that the weather is slightly foggy. I was not aware that rescue helicopters, I think worldwide, cannot take off in foggy weather or in, you have to have a certain visibility to take off, is that correct? That's yeah. right. Mm -hmm. uh, we need at least 800 meters of visibility. Okay. And um, operating um, the way we do uh, requires visual reference mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. the ground, obviously, because um, you don't have any instrument approaches yeah. onto uh, <laughs> crash sites on the road or anywhere. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, we are really depending on, on fairly good weather at Fair least weather. To, okay. to see uh, obstacles and stuff. Mm -hmm. Speaking of the helicopter and in terms of operation, your crew, do you always operate it as a single pilot or do you have another crew member who is so to speak, a co-pilot for you? Normally, the operation requires uh, three crew mm -hmm. members on board. Mm -hmm. So that is at least uh, the pilot in command. Yeah. Then we have a uh, doctor in the back. Mm -hmm. And the left-hand seat is normally occupied by the so-called technical crew member. Mm -hmm. And in this case, it is a trained medic, a mm -hmm. paramedic, that is also trained to work as a almost a co-pilot, but mm -hmm. unable to fly itself, uh, himself. So. Um, they, they can assist um, with navigating mm -hmm. or operating mm -hmm. uh, the, the autopilot, for instance. Mm -hmm. They uh, spot obstacles, they help choosing the right landing spot, mm -hmm. um, but they are unable to fly themselves. Understood. Speaking yeah. of landings, can a rescue helicopter land literally anywhere where there's the crash site, you see a field right next to it, you can land there? Or are there some restrictions where you cannot land? Well, basically, you can <laughs> you can land like anywhere you want. Mm -hmm. um, there are several things that that the the spot um, needs to fulfill. First mm -hmm. of all, it needs to be large enough, yeah. um, obviously. Then it needs to be um, a surface that is fairly flat. So mm -hmm. we have a limitation of um, twelve degree or some helicopters like okay, fourteen yeah. degrees of slope. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is a limitation. The surface needs to be um, strong enough to bear. The, the, the weight of the yeah. helicopter, mm -hmm. and of course the the most important thing is that you the, the area itself must not pose any threat to others. So mm -hmm. any loose items, any any tarp or anything that that might might cause any uh, potential hazard to mm -hmm. bystanders or to yourself eventually, mm -hmm. um, that, that restricts us. Can you just land in someone's garden? I mean, if... <laughs> we can, and, and sometimes we, we even do. Yeah, <laughs> okay, good. I think, that's, I think that's, for me, the really exciting part, that you never really know where your landing spot will be. You have to decide that on the spot when you are on approach, okay, I'm gonna go here and there and touch down. That's, 
I think that's the really exciting part about it. It is. That? Sometimes it is. <laughs> Sometimes yeah. it is. Okay. Can you mention one of the most uh, interesting spots you've landed or maybe the, one of the most risky spots you've landed? Well, I remember two, two landings quite well because they, were, they, they felt quite impressive <laughs> even. Okay. So um, one was uh, right on the foot of the um, TV tower on Berlin, Alexanderplatz. <laughs> Um, that was amazing because a, that, that tower is just so huge and, and you, <laughs> you fly uh, really below, below mm -hmm. the, um, uh, the platform where the people mm -hmm. are um, having dinner or anything. <laughs> yeah. So that, that was quite impressive. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other was also in Berlin uh, right next to Gedächtniskirche, so the memorial church. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of these requirements, um, okay, you said you've landed at the Alexanderplatz. Uh, how does that convert if you were to land on a highway? What are the dangers landing on a, on a highway, for example? Well, um, landing on a, on a highway or any kind of road that is not closed down mm -hmm. for traffic um, always has that risk of, of endangering um, other people. So mm -hmm. that, that is quite dangerous. Mm -hmm. And normally we, we only land on, on roads or highways mm -hmm. that are closed down, actually. Closed down, okay, yeah. Yeah, because I think that, yeah, you are the center of attraction in that moment oh, and yeah. people just get completely you know, <laughs> drawn by you and I think could cause another accident uh, leading to that because they are distracted from what yeah, you're Yeah, we seeing. absolutely have to, to refrain from, from causing any yeah, damage yeah. to anybody. Speaking of your operational area, how large is this area for a helicopter like yours? Normally in Germany you say it's, it's like 70 kilometers of, of radius. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. But of course, depending on the kind of emergency that you have, mm -hmm. it might be further away, but mm -hmm. most of the emergencies are, are much closer to our base, actually. Okay. 70 kilometers, how, how quick is your response time then? Let's say I have had a car crash on a highway and I call 911 or 112. 112. Sorry, 112. <laughs> um, how quickly are you from my call? Do you arrive at my uh, at my car crash? How long does that take? I would say it takes about one minute for us to be to be tasked. So mm -hmm. for the rescue coordination center to to give us that mission. Yeah. Okay. Um, then it normally takes us about two minutes to get airborne. Wow. And okay. then um, we fly it. It's 120 knots. 120 knots. Okay. That's your like cruising speed. Not cruising speed, but your <laughs> getting to the yeah, target. Yeah. It's, it's the cru speed. It's, it's the normal cruising <laughs> normal speed actually. Cruising speed, okay. The V and E is about 150 knots, but but okay. you you rarely. Uh, yeah, this. Okay. Speaking again of my car crash that I've had, um, let's say a, an ambulance has already arrived. Do you somehow establish communication with the ambulance car on ground prior your landing, or do you solely just fly to the to the scene and then establish communication on ground? Now we have a, a special tactical radio in mm -hmm. order to to have contact to the um, medical staff on ground, but. Um, it depends strongly on the, the time that uh, the medical crews have. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So um, if they are um, busy helping the patient, mm -hmm. they cannot they go cannot to their yeah. radio set. Yeah. So um, in many times we just land there. It, it is helpful if we can spot the ambulance mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, from above yeah. because it's easy to identify the target. Sure. Yeah, okay. Okay, this might be a bit an interesting one in terms of helpful tips if mm -hmm. you are the first responder on the scene. Are there any like hand signals you could give to the pilot uh, when you are on approach? Is there something that we can teach? <laughs> the, the whole hand signal topic is, is always quite um, <laughs> difficult because people tend to do things that are, are rather confusing than, yeah. than helpful. So uh, I would not recommend to, to use many hand signals okay. Okay. other than maybe pointing to a, to a certain thing that could be any threat to us, like mm -hmm. pole sticking out of the ground that yeah. we might not see because of, of high grass or anything. Okay, okay, good. I just thought like someone would like guide no, you. No, rather, <laughs> rather not. <laughs> rather not. Okay, good. okay, good. How many flights can you average a day? Because your shift starts at 6.30 in the morning until 8 o'clock in the evening, right? At least 8 o'clock. Yeah, so how many flights would you average? Roughly? Well, um, it's about four each day. Oh, wow, is that many? Okay, I expect missions. So oh, uh, missions, so to speak. Yeah, each okay. mission, at least two flights normally. <laughs> Do you have to refuel after each flight you come back because your tank capacity is relatively limited? It depends on the flight time that we, mm -hmm. we, we spend on the mission. So, um, especially in summertime when when the um, the temperature is, is a limiting factor to us and we mm -hmm. need to, to keep an eye on, on um, takeoff weight, mm -hmm. um, it might be that we have to refill 
after every landing here. Yeah. Normally, you, you can do like one or two missions until you have to refill. Crazy. But funny enough, we can actually see right here, all of the helicopters in Germany, the rescue helicopters, are called Christoph. Why are they called Christoph? There must be some kind of meaning behind it. Basically, the ADAC has always been an, an automobile club. Yeah. So um, the whole topic in the 70s was reducing the numbers of uh, casualties through mm -hmm. car crashes. Mm -hmm. So when they, they came up with the idea of, of having a helicopter that actually takes the emergency doctor to the patient, yeah. to the crash site, mm -hmm. Um, they came up with the name of Christoph because it is derived uh, from the Christophorus, so, which is the saint of the traveling people, the patron yeah. saint of the traveling people. Gotcha. And okay. since people in their cars are essentially traveling, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that seemed to be quite fitting and uh, it still sticks with us. Now speaking of the Christophs, how many Christophs are there in Germany? Last time I counted, I think it was like 82 Christoph helicopters. Okay. Of which uh, 37 are operated by ADAC Luftrettung. My last question, can you explain us a little bit of the background of the ADAC organization? How does it actually work? Because I've heard it's a non-profit organization. Just put one and one together. Um, actually, it is non-profit, mm -hmm. but we get, um, we get paid by the health insurance companies. Okay. So um, since everybody in Germany is, ha has health insurance, yeah. mm -hmm. um, wherever anyone um, gets our, our help, uh, mm -hmm. gets treated or transported, their health insurance actually will um, pay, pay for that. And with this last question, we come to the end of this insightful video interview. I really hope there were some great takeaways for our future helicopter pilots. Now to let you into a secret of mine, it's still a goal of mine to get my helicopter license when I step off the 747 after my very last landing. So this video definitely guided me in the right direction. Therefore, a huge thank you to Jens and the ADAC Luftrettung for making this video possible and letting me tap into an aviation field I'm not so familiar with. Those were some of the most exciting days of this year for me. Also, let me know in the comments below if you want me to do more rotary wing related videos. It's definitely a niche here on YouTube, but such an exciting part of the aviation industry. And on that bombshell, here's your checklist for today. Subscribe to my channel, check. Activate the notification bell, check. Follow my Instagram account, check. And perform a touch and go at my website. And don't forget, a good pilot, either fixed wing or rotary wing, is always learning. Wishing all the best. Your Captain Joe.